All right. So tonight we uh, we are uh, again. Oh, uh, we are very fortunate to have Dr. Brandon Beck back to see us. Uh, he's he's spoken to us a couple times before. Uh, he's got some books back here again. Uh, Christmas is coming up. Okay, Christmas is a little more than a, a month away. Those would make great Christmas gifts. There you go. Great Christmas gifts. Uh, Dr. Beck actually just gave us uh, a couple of uh, volumes here for our camp library. How about that? So thank you very much for those. You're welcome. And, uh, you know, again, along those lines, Will has said that, you know, that will be our permanent meeting place. We can leave our flags up there. We can leave our table set. We can have a bookcase over there, you know? We can put prints on the wall, you know? Confederate prints. I mean, we're, we're, we can make it our home, you know? Can we take that pit print up there behind me? Huh? Can we take that? That's pretty. Yeah, it's New York. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, but anyway, I appreciate Dr. Beck giving us those couple of uh, of uh, books there, that's, that's great. Uh, and he has, like, uh, as you can see, authored a number of books, uh, a lot on Forrest and his campaigns in the Western theater. Uh, he is from uh, Columbus, Mississippi, and uh, uh, he can be reached at the email address on your agenda right there. But at this time, I'd like to uh, uh, introduce Dr. Brandon Beck. Thank you a lot. Thank you for the invitation. Very strong. I found it very moving. Appreciate it. I think this is my third time uh, with y'all. Uh, y'all are really an admirable camp. As I listen to the announcements and the upcoming activities, I, I realize it reminded me all the more of what, what a fine camp this is. I think this is my third time here. Uh, I hope there's a fourth, uh, and if you have me, uh, I hope it's soon, because I'd like to uh, talk to you that time, the fourth time, about the full-scale battle of Oklahoma, uh, Mississippi. What I'm going to do tonight is to describe to you the just as remarkable uh, background uh, to that great forest victory in February of 1864. Uh, in 58 years of teaching history, I've learned that uh, background is as important to history as location is to real estate. Uh, so important that even background has background to it. But I'm going to confine myself tonight to just the immediate background of Forrest's amazing achievement at Oklahoma in February 1864. This this story is. I think uh, just as amazing and it's almost unknown. Uh, if the virus will ever allow libraries to reopen, particularly libraries in West Tennessee around Jackson, Tennessee, uh, it's my immediate plan to, to get up there and, and see what kind of source material uh, I can find uh, for this. Uh, the title is uh, Battle of Oklahoma, Part 1. Uh, forest in West Tennessee, Christmas of 1863. Uh, let's let's start with the cover of the handout. Uh, you, you'll, you'll see that we're going to start on the slow side to try to set everything in place, and then once but then once Forrest hit the saddle, uh, headed for Jackson, Tennessee. This begins to move at lightning speed. Uh, I'd like to begin with the uh, pictures in the handout. First, the cover. Uh, the cover of the handout is the cover of my Battle of Oklahoma uh, book. Uh, the picture is of uh, Forrest uh, doing something in Oklahoma that couldn't anybody else in the Confederacy do, uh, and that was lead that kind of charge uh, against those kind of odds and drive the largest Union raiding force of the war back to the streets of Memphis. And he did it with 2,500 men. Uh, a remarkable thing. And where we're going with that tonight is 
where did those 25 men come from? And how did Forrest get them from their homes to uh, this place? Uh, I better introduce, we better go to the map, the first page of the handout. Uh, the subtitle of the book is uh, Defending the Mississippi Prairie. The prairie is, is that part of Mississippi uh, running uh, north and south parallel to the G, to the M and O Railroad, uh, running Corinth to uh, Meridian. The prairie was one of those rare things in the war, as far as the South was concerned. It was an enormously fertile, what was called bread basket, uh, for the Confederate armies. Uh, and on top of all of that fertility, and all of that corn and cotton and livestock, on top of all that thing, those things, there's a railroad connection at Meridian, eastbound. And if we're talking about late 1863, early 1864, eastbound means Atlanta bound, because there was no doubt in anybody's mind that Sherman was coming after Atlanta come spring of 1864. Uh, this operation of Sherman's is called the uh, is called Sherman's Meridian Campaign. It involved 35,000 infantry under Sherman marching from Jackson to Meridian, uh, burning and ransacking everything in their route uh, to 25 miles out on either side of the road, left a smoking ruin, uh, and then 7,500 Union cavalry and General William Sewey Smith coming south from uh, Collierville, uh, New. Albany, uh, hitting the railroad at about Tupelo, and then following it down to Oklahoma, Egypt, Prairie Station, West Point, uh, uh, the junction for Columbus, and on down to about Macon. Uh, and what that means is ripping up the railroad behind him and burning everything in the fields beside him as he comes as he comes south. Uh, this was this was a horrific invasion. It involved close to 45,000 men. It's, it's, no, it's no raid. And the whole purpose of it, I think, was to uh, weaken the defenses of Atlanta uh, in advance of Sherman's spring campaign. If you turn the page, there are two pictures uh, that I want to explain to you. And I want to pass, well, let me tell you about the first picture, the larger picture. Uh, this picture uh, hangs in the UDC Museum. Uh, of the Stephen D. Lee home. Stephen D. Lee, of course, the author of our charge. This picture hangs in the UDC Museum upstairs, second floor of the uh, Lee of the Lee home. It was painted in the 1890s, and Lee's family wanted the painter uh, to paint a scene that would evoke the fact that the Oklahoma operation was the first operation that Forrest served under Lee. And since it is entirely a winter story, my story tonight is almost entirely a dead winter uh, story, the family wanted Forrest portrayed in a winter setting. And it, it's not easy to see it as a winter setting uh, in that uh, photograph. But I'll send this around. This is a color, color photograph of the of the painting. You can see quite clearly how wintry the scene uh, is. Uh, the painting belongs to Mississippi State University. Uh, they're glad to be rid of it, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> they don't especially like anybody knowing that fact, uh, but I did have to get their permission to uh, uh, publish it. It was published in my Oklahoma book for the, for the very first time. Forrest, of course, is the central figure uh, in the next time I come and of course tonight. Uh, top right corner is Colonel Tyree Bell, a farmer and a colonel of infantry from Gallatin, Tennessee, who contributes mightily uh, to what is going to happen, what is going to happen uh, tonight. Uh, he, he was a remarkable man, as, as you'll see, and, and Forrest specifically asked for him uh, to, attempt to accompany him on this West Tennessee operation. Uh, going into the winter of 63-64, uh, the Confederacy was faced with two dangerous uh, emergencies. 
One was long standing and not getting any better, and that was the manpower crisis. Uh, the cumulative total, counting major battles only in the Western theater from the fall of Fort Donelson to the great victory at Chickamauga, comes to just over 145,000. Uh, that, that is an enormous price to pay. Uh, and we, of course, could not afford that price. And manpower is just an ongoing crisis uh, for it. Uh, the second emergency uh, jumped up fairly quickly, and that was the vulnerability of the Mississippi Prairie, as I described it. It's crucial. It has to be defended. It's extremely vulnerable. Jefferson Davis saw it coming as early as August 63, and on the 3rd of 1863, 3rd of August 1863, the man he appointed to command in North Mississippi reached Oklahoma to set up his headquarters there, and that was Stephen D. Lee. Uh, the president asked uh, Lee to carefully enumerate his, his wants and his needs uh, in, this, in this department. And Lee sent him a list of all the things that you would expect a new department commander to need in a region that is extremely vulnerable. But he told the president that what he wanted most, he said, what I need most is that I need an executive officer whose very name will inspire civilian and military morale throughout Mississippi. And he clearly meant Forrest. He wanted Forrest to serve under him uh, in the defense of the Mississippi Prairie. There was a problem. Forrest at that time was with the Army of Tennessee. He commanded one wing of the Army of Tennessee under General Braxton Bragg. Uh, Forrest wanted out. Uh, Davis was perfectly willing to accept Lee's, go by Lee's urging to, to bring him, but it was, it was a very difficult thing to do, especially in the fall of 63, when the Chattanooga-Chickamauga situation blew up. Uh, nothing else mattered except the outcome of those, those two struggles there, and Forrest just had to put up with it a, a, little, bit, a little bit longer. Uh, Chickamauga was a barren victory. We had nearly 24,000 casualties. We, we won a great victory, 24,000 casualties, and it was a barren victory. We didn't get Chattanooga, which is what we needed out of it. What we got instead was a disgraceful revolt uh, among Bragg's high command uh, against him, uh, in my opinion, trying to blame everything that had gone wrong on the, in the West on him. On, on him rather than on themselves, who I think were the real architects of disaster. But I, I don't want to go down, don't want to go down that road. It got to be so bad that on the night that President Davis decided to go to Missionary Ridge, uh, Bragg's headquarters, uh, he got there on the 9th of October. Uh, for the first, he, he hoped to bring peace to the high command, and then on a second level, kind of see if Bragg wouldn't relent to Forrest being transferred uh, elsewhere. Uh, he talked with the high command there for four days, and then on the 13th of October, after four days, uh, Bragg relented and told the president that he was more than willing to accept Forrest's request for a transfer. Forrest, however, was not there. Forrest was on leave. And so the president left Forrest a notice, or sent it to him one, I'm not sure uh, which, uh, asking him, Forrest, to meet him in Montgomery on the 27th of October uh, to uh, determine his next command uh, responsibility. Uh, that same day, Tyree Bell comes into our story. Tyree Bell, as I said, was a Gallatin, Tennessee farmer. He knew a lot of Tennessee farmers, and he knew mostly uh, cavalry officers, Tennessee partisan cavalry officers. Uh, 
he was an infantry colonel, not one of them, but he knew them all, and he believed that a solution, a partial solution to the manpower crisis would be to recruit men in West Tennessee, even though it's behind Yankee lines, he thought it could be done. Uh, he gave proof of that on the uh, 13th of October when he rode into Bragg's camp with 2,500 Tennessee cavalrymen. He had recruited himself uh, in West Tennessee up around Jackson at a place that he, a recruiting station that he called Camp, uh, Camp Bell. Uh, that, was, that was pretty impressive and it just about seals where it is uh, Forrest uh, is, is going. Uh, on the 27th of October, Davis and Forrest met at Montgomery, and the president asked if Forrest would be interested in serving under Stephen D. Lee in North Mississippi. Uh, the president already knew, and Forrest I'm sure was aware also, of the great recruiting potential in West Tennessee, and Forrest was quick to agree. Bragg was quick to agree, although he could only spread, he could only spare 300 men for Forrest to take with him uh, to, uh, to Oklahoma. Uh, that was, that, that, that's a problem, but uh, he expected to find some troops in uh, Oklahoma already, but this did not happen. Uh, he arrived in Oklahoma on the 24th of November, uh, and he found that Stephen D. Lee was also a firm believer in recruiting in West Tennessee. Even though it's behind Yankee lines, even though it's getting into winter, even though it's getting into real close to Christmas, even though men that he is able to recruit are going to be willing to leave their families at Christmas time and also to the mercies of the Union occupation, which was on again, off again. But when it was on, it was pretty, it was pretty ferocious. So this is going to be, this is going to be a real challenge. They all agreed, uh, and the decision was made uh, that Forrest would take a force. Now I have to take you back to the map again. Uh, the map shows you two railroads. The railroad running from Memphis east to Corinth is more or less the border. It's actually kind of more the border in that it was fortified and constantly patrolled by the Union Army. It's, it's the dividing line between Confederate lines and Union lines. And it is in some ways a no man's land, but most of the time the Union uh, had the upper hand up there. They decided that Forrest would take what troops he had, by now it amounts to about 600 men, and cross the railroad at some point undetected by the fact that General Lee would create a, divir a, a diversion somewhere along the railroad in his favor so that he could, that he could slip he could slip in. Forrest asked Lee if Bell could accompany, Ty Tyree Bell could accompany the expedition, and Lee said that that would be an excellent, an excellent idea, and they decided that Bell would go across first. He'd go alone up around Jackson to his Camp Bell and begin working and spreading the word that Forrest is coming. Forrest is coming. Uh, and then whenever Forrest decided we've run out of safe time up here, uh, he would join Forrest with the men he had raised at Jackson and they would, they would attempt to get back in, across Confederate lines, cross the railroad uh, again. So everybody is in perfect agreement. Uh, pretty rare, pretty rare thing. Uh, and it now remained, before they left, for Forrest to try to uh, recruit men in and around Oklahoma. Uh, and he was pretty energetic at it. Uh, an Alabama cavalryman who had ridden with Forrest before, named Robert E. Curry, uh, wrote home to his wife about this recruiting. He said, General Forrest don't want no one going with him unwilling." If some of us don't pay us a visit to Alton, a 
prisoner of war camp, we will be lucky. And then comes this description for us that I've never read anywhere. For I know that our leader, the great go-ahead Forrest, is a rush man and he is fond of danger. One of the recruits that joined up there or at, at, at Oklahoma uh, was named uh, John Johnston. And I'll, I'll quote from him several times tonight. He wrote about this early stage of the operations. General Forrest is like a steam locomotive, trembling under the pressure of its own awful power, ever ready to move, still, still only when constrained. He gathered in total about 600 men to go north. Uh, he planned the diversion with Lee, and he sets out for, if you'd like to go to hand out the first map in the, I'm sorry, the second map in the handout. Prairie map we've already looked at, but the next page behind the photographs uh, is where we, where we are, where we are. Uh, they left Oklahoma on the 29th of November. And I, I want to constantly remind you, this is, this is dead winter. And it's dead winter in one of the coldest areas of the south in wintertime. That, that's, that's West Tennessee. This, this is hard. They left Oklahoma on the 29th of uh, November. On the 1st of December, they were at Ripley, Mississippi. On the 2nd of December, uh, Lee attacked the railroad at Moscow, uh, Tennessee, closer to uh, Memphis. Uh, on the 3rd, Forrest crossed the Hatchie River at Bolivar, uh, north of Ripley. That was a tough crossing. Uh, they managed to find a flatboat ferry. Uh, and Forrest got everybody, they're undetected. Lee's diversion has worked. They're, they're well behind Yankee lines already, and they've got 75 miles to go. They got across undetected, and as they were moving out for Jackson, which is the destination, uh, Forrest detailed a handful of men and told them, in effect, take that ferry upstream somewhere and stash it away and then let me know where it is. Clearly Forrest is not planning to come back this way. He's going to go out a different way, uh, even though the different way he's going back is three times as difficult and, and, and dangerous, but there, there, there's a good reason. There's a good reason for that. They arrived in Jackson on the 5th of December. Uh, and Forrest put out scouts immediately all throughout northwest, northwest Tennessee. Scouts to look for likely recruits and scouts to look for federal troops. Because if they are closed in on with any kind of suddenness, it, it, it's going to be a disaster. So he's got to have feelers out uh, recruiting. The first step was establishing 12 or 13 recruiting stations, mostly shebang kind of things, uh, around Jackson. And then uh, further away from Jackson, what were called rendezvous points. John Wyeth, who wrote the first biography of Forrest in the 1890s, talked to a lot of Confederate soldiers who rode with Forrest. And he said about these rendezvous spots, they were unfrequented spots, often in the dense cane breaks of ravines and thickets of river bottoms. In these lonely places, as fast as levees were secured, they were enlisted. Now I had three questions. I'm not close to an answer. I can't, I can't get to the sources yet. And I hope that the sources have something. I wonder, why did so many men come out? One explanation is Forrest's own personal magnetism. Uh, I think that's a very real factor. Uh, John Johnston wrote 
Uh, Forrest's name brought joy and hope everywhere. The country is now seeming thick with Confederate soldiers. Again, the effect of his presence can hardly be described or exaggerated. The news of his coming spread rapidly and caused joy and hope and enthusiasm everywhere. So Forrest's personal magnetism is, 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 is partly responsible. I think secondly uh, is what you might call ordinary, that's, that's not the right word, but, but, but Confederate patriotism. Uh, especially uh, under the in the iron fist of Union occupation of that part of the country. That, 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 that Union occupation changed a lot of people's political opinions and Forrest is there to uh, take them up as well. And then there's the matter of conscripts. Uh, draftees who have slipped away uh, one way or another. I meant to point out to you when I talked about the manpower crisis that the Army of Tennessee had its own conscript bureau apart from and far better than the department in Richmond. It was headed by Gideon Pillow, and Bragg supported him with everything he had, and so did the overall commander over there at Joseph E. Johnston. Pillow did superb work uh, bringing in vast numbers, uh, and Bell uh, was one of Pillow's officers, and so Bell in particular is well versed with uh, the problems and the opportunities of uh, conscripts. Bell, quote, knew where to look for stragglers, where to look for deserters, and where to look for those who had managed to escape the conscript office. They sure came out fast. By early December, Forrest wrote to General Johnston uh, in Meridian uh, that I have a thousand men, all unarmed, uh, but I'm sending them south now. And those men went out uh, roughly the way Forrest had come in. And they were undetected going out as Forrest had been, had been coming in. The Union dragnet hadn't been thrown over this operation yet. Forrest also said to uh, Johnston, uh, and I think this is, this is fascinating, you, you, you know, I think, that this is not the first time Forrest has raised a command out of nothing. It's the first time he's done it behind Yankee lines, but he's done this before, and he's generally paid for it out of his own pocket. I think that this may have been the last time he would be able to do that. I think that this is the end of the forest, of forest funds from the pre-war period. Uh, he wrote to Johnston, I am in great need of money. I have had to advance to my quartermaster $20,000 from my pocket, from my private funds to subsist the command uh, so far. I think he's done it before, but this is the last time he's able to uh, able to do it. And he, he comes out of the war, as you know, a, a poor man. Uh, he told Johnson he was all, also going to need help in getting out when the time came. He was going to need some kind of diversion like that that had got him in to get him uh, out back across the railroad headed to uh, Mississippi. Uh, he said, General Johnson, I will have more than I can manage with the raw and untrained men uh, that I have. I, I should emphasize that the men who are coming in are almost all unmounted, and they're almost all unarmed. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be a, a remarkable thing if, if, if Forrest can pull this yeah. off, so to speak. As Christmas got nearer, uh, scouts began to alert Forrest that uh, we are running out of time. That Union General Hurlbut, and you might want to go to the next map in the handout, Union General Hurlbut 
uh, is aware of you and is beginning to construct the jaws of a trap. Uh, and it may well be the time uh, to get out. Uh, Forrest took them at their word. He immediately called in all of his men. Uh, Bell came down from his camp bell with about a thousand men. Uh, Forrest has got about 15. And so all in all, as they prepare to go south again, Forrest has 2,500 men, most of them unarmed, most of them unmounted. He's got 40 wagons bulging with captured supplies, 40, 80 mules, 300 head of cattle, 200 hogs, and this procession, this procession starts from Jackson uh, on the uh, on the 23rd of uh, December. Uh, the basic assumption in Hurlbut's trap, his Hurlbut's basic assumption, was that Forrest is going to go out the way he came in, because it's relatively easy. He knows the route. He'll surely come out that way, much closer to Mem. I'm sorry, much closer to Corinth, much towards the east. Uh, he wouldn't think about moving southwest from Jackson and crossing the Hatchie and then the Wolf and then the railroad, all dangerously near Memphis. But that was exactly Forrest's intention. Remember the ferry that he had ordered taken upstream. The soldiers hid it, stashed it away uh, at a landing at a crossing called Estenala. Uh, if you turn to the next map, if you see the, uh, the arrow for Confederate Colonel Richardson, right where he crossed, right where that arrow crosses the Hatchie is where Estenala uh, was. It's, it's near Hillsville, Tennessee, modern Hillsville, Tennessee uh, today. The greatest danger Forrest faced, that, that's where he's going. He knows the ferry's there. That's where he's headed uh, with this incredible caravan uh, of his. Uh, the greatest danger Forrest faced coming back out came from the uh, Yankee force at LaGrange, Tennessee, uh, commanded by Benjamin Grierson. Uh, Grierson's role in the trap was to set in motion a couple of regiments of cavalry under Edward, uh, Edward Prince, Colonel Edward Prince, set in motion a couple of regiments of cavalry to work their way up the hatchet, scouring the hatchet for bridges, crossings, and hidden Ferries. Uh, Britain uh, was Prince, I'm sorry. Prince was a good officer, but he had a lot against him in, in this, particularly the nature of the Hatchie itself. Uh, John Johnson wrote The Hatchie in winter is deep, icy, fast flowing, and inaccessible except by narrow paths known to country people only through overgrown thickets that span a mile out on either side uh, of, the, uh, of the river. He, this is a finding, Estenala, that it exists it is a difficult thing. Uh, Johnson went on to write about the Hatchie uh, at that point. He was writing in 1902. Uh, he wrote that a ferry or a U.S. battleship, either one, could have been hidden anywhere in there. Prince found the site, but Forrest got there first, as usual. Forrest left Jackson on the 23rd. 
Colonel Richardson was at the head of the column. Bell was in the middle of the column with all the wagons, all the cattle, all the hogs. Uh, a smaller force under Colonel Wisdom uh, went out to the east and fought a rear guard action at Jack's Creek, uh, which is a marked site, although I've not been able to get to it. Uh, and Forrest and the escort bringing up the rear. Forrest was the last one up to leave, up to leave Jackson. Richardson, Colonel Richardson, got to the Estenola crossing on the 24th and secured the ferry just hours before Prince got there. Uh, Richardson began to cross men over, not knowing Prince was there. Uh, Prince jumped those men that got over, uh, drove them back to the water's edge, and one of them wrote, we just dug in, held on, and waited for General Forrest. Uh, it was a bad situation, and Colonel Richardson sent word back five miles back to Colonel Bell asking for help. Uh, Bell's got the slowest column of all, that's why he's in the middle uh, with the cattle and the hogs and so forth. But Bell rode forward himself, uh, took charge of the situation, continued to cross men over, crossed over himself and drove Prince back away from that bank of the river. Uh, which allowed the process, the, the, which allowed the, 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 the crossing, the crossing to uh, continue. He rallied Richardson's men and drove Prince uh, back, enabling the crossing to uh, continue. Uh, he and Richardson then went on to organize the main crossing, which is going to be on Christmas Day, get everybody across on Christmas Day. And then Bell. With those arrangements made on the east bank, uh, Bell crossed himself over to the west bank. He went across not on the boat. He went across sitting next to one of the Teamsters in a mule-driven wagon. Uh, the wagon capsized. The driver, the, the Teamster, was, was swept away and never seen again. Uh, the wagon sunk like a stone. Uh, the mules were still in their traces and Bell had been thrown up over the front and into the tracery of, of, of the mules. And he was, the mules are fighting for their life, screaming in panic. Uh, and, and Bell is caught up in that. Forrest was watching from a very a little piece of high ground on the uh, river's edge and saw Bell's plate and knocked his, the hat back off his head and drew his knife and dove into uh, the hatchet and swam to Bell, cut the mules loose and they, they, they swam away, they, they swam back to where they come from. They, they, were, they were all right. Uh, Bell was free of them but he wasn't strong enough, he said, to swim against the current across to the east bank. And so he thought the best thing he could do was, was, was to drift, to tread water, and try to wait for a, a snag that he could pull himself up on and get over. Uh, he believed that he was beginning to freeze to death. Uh, and I, I'm, sure, I'm sure he was. Some soldiers who had already crossed uh, ran up with him, uh, parallel to him, and managed to get him out and built him a fire and found him a bottle. Uh, and he, he, he managed, he, he did manage, he did manage to live. Uh, so they're all across the hatching. Uh, Forrest rode up, no, they're not all across the hatchet, I'm sorry. Uh, Forrest rode up on Christmas Eve to take charge of the whole operation. K 
Captain Pirtle said it for us, I swear I never heard such a voice. It penetrated you through and through and made you move. Johnston wrote, when Forrest came, everything and everybody, I, this makes me think of Forrest as the steam locomotive, everything and everybody was put into motion. Men, wagons were hurried onto the boat. Men and horses that could not swim were driven to the river and made to learn how to swim. Uh, and it all got, oh, it all was done on uh, Christmas Day. Uh, the whole command uh, was across. Early Christmas morning, they ran into the rest of Prince's force. They drove it off in the direction of Somerville, and the so-called Battle of Somerville is the largest action uh, of, this, of this operation. Forrest took 35 or 40 prisoners, and typical casualty figures for a, a, a hot, a hot uh, skirmish. There remained the Wolf River. Uh, and forest scouts could find no bridge, none, across, and no hidden ferry this time. A tight fix. Then one of the scouts, a Colonel Longwood, came to Forrest and told him that they missed the burners, the bridge burners, missed one bridge near Lafayette, Tennessee. They took down the handrails, they took up the floorboards, but for some reason they burned, they didn't burn anything in that pile, didn't burn the frame of the bridge itself, but were in a small redoubt on uh, the south side uh, of the wolf. I think we could get over there. And Forrest moves everything in that uh, direction. Uh, John Johnston remembered uh, that as they approached the wolf, Johnston was a Colonel Neely's uh, adjutant, and Johnston remembered that uh, Forrest summoned Colonel Neely to the head of the column. I was with the Colonel. As we rode up to the head of the column, we could see Forrest uh, ahead, just off to the side, reins in his left hand, right hand, and in his hand a piece of paper. It turned out to be a dispatch he had captured in some kind of way. It was a copy of Hurlbut's orders to watch for Forrest between Salisbury, where he crossed going up, and Corinth. He's going to go out that way, watch for him there. Don't let him escape. Uh, Forrest read this out loud to us. This is a side of Forrest. I've never seen him camera. Right? Forrest read this out loud to us. He read this in a soft, musical sort of tone, somewhere between a laugh and a chuckle. Uh, he, he knew already that he had fooled them, but it was nice to see paper evidence that he had fooled them and, and pretty badly. When they got to Lafayette, they, some Federals were at the railroad depot. They ran them back across the river. Uh, then they sent their, then Forrest sent his own pickets down to the bridge site. Uh, one of the pickets came back uh, saying to Johnston, great God, how they ran. A force from the east came in by train, but the train went right through all of this and stopped closer to Collierville and the men on, the Union soldiers on board went into camp. And so by the 27th of November, sorry, 27th of December, uh, it's all over. Uh, Forrest is in Holly Springs, headed for Como. Uh, his losses are very slight. The entire, they didn't lose one cow or hog. Uh, and as far as I know, only the, the the Wagoneer was the, was the only, the only fatality. Uh, how did unarmed men do this, largely unarmed men do this? Forrest said their greatest weapon is noise. That's how they did it. They could make, they could sound like 10,000 men 
with fully armed, 10,000 men. Grierson sent Hurlbut a dispatch saying, Forrest has gone south like hell. He crossed the Wolf River at Lafayette this morning. Period. End of message. Three, three more points. When Forrest, I'm sorry, when Sherman learned that Forrest was in West Tennessee recruiting, he attached little importance to it. He said, quote, Forrest may cavort about the countryside all he pleases, but for every man he recruits, he will need one good man to guard. If you look at the last page of the, of the handout, that belies, yes, that, that, that belies Sherman's quote. Over the next month in Como, Mississippi, Forrest took that command and imposed that order of battle on it. Uh, he was able to get arms from the department commander Polk, uh, uniforms. He rode out of Como, Mississippi, westbound, sorry, eastbound, uh, with a fully formed, fully organized, fully disciplined, well-armed force of about 2,500 men. These are the men that he led in that charge, cover of the, uh, of, of the, of, of the handout. He went to Oxford from Como because he had a lot of friends in Oxford. He knew a lot of Oxford people who had connections in Memphis. And forest people were telling him that something big is cooking in Collier something really big. What it was, of course, is this 7,700-man Union Cavalry Force being concentrated and prepared to come down uh, on the railroad through the prairie to meet Sherman in, in Meridian. So Forrest moved further east, I'm sorry, at Oxford, and this is the last of the point, at Oxford, as he was preparing to move east, uh, he discovered that 12 men had deserted. We can understand that people at home, Christmas, alone, 12, 12 young boys thought they were uh, deserted. Forrest was enraged. He sent out a Provo guard uh, with orders to bring them back alive. Uh, and they did, they were, they were easily caught offered no resistance. Uh, Forrest uh, ordered that they uh, be, uh, all 12 be shot uh, for desertion. Uh, every clergyman in Oxford uh, came to Forrest's tent to plead for those boys' lives. Uh, and many mothers of soldiers uh, came to plead for those boys' lives. Uh, Forrest would have none of it. Uh, he ordered uh, the men to dig their own graves, to stand at the foot of the grave, and face a firing squad. Uh, he had already spoken a few words to the firing squad. Uh, he let it go to ready, and then to aim, and then the firing squad knew don't have your finger on the trigger, because this is an object lesson rather than an execution, uh, and their lives were their lives were uh, spared. And that force, that whole 2,500 man force, that was force uh, from that from that point on. It was all he had at Oklahoma, and it was the, the core uh, of what he had for the rest the last tough year of the uh, of the war. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for having me.